Hi everyone, this is Justin uh, from the University of Liège and thank you for attending this presentation uh, on IOM and on its implementation with IPv6 as an encapsulation protocol. If you don't know about IOM, don't be afraid and please don't go because I'm going to introduce you to it just right now. So what is IOM? I hope you're still there and you didn't leave. So IOM means in situ operations, administration and maintenance. So basically this is just an in situ uh, OAM technique. And the term in situ here refers to the fact that data are recorded within packets. So data are part of headers, not part of the payload, right? And you can insert a lot of data such as node ID, uh, the ID of the ingress or egress interface, a timestamp, transit delay, queue length, buffer occupancy, and so on. And you could consider IOM as something hybrid because it can either be an active or a passive OEM type, which means that actually you could just uh, generate dedicated traffic for IOM, or you could choose to inject IOM inside in-flight traffic. And currently, uh, IOM is under standardization in the IETF, uh, and more specifically in the IPPM working group where I am involved. And there are a lot of drafts uh, related to IOM. Uh, so for instance, the first bullet on the slide, you have the IOM data draft, which is the more important one. And this draft defines actually every kind of data that can be inserted and also IOM namespaces. I will talk about it uh, later. You have also uh, a draft on IOM flags. Uh, I think that right now we have uh, up to three flags. Uh, I won't go too much into details, but there are uh, the, loop back, the loop back flag, sorry, uh, the active flag, and uh, I don't even remember the third one. Well, that's not important. And you have also a lot more drive, draft, uh, one for each encapsulation protocol. So obviously in this talk, we will focus on the IPv6 protocol. You have also um, a, Yang, uh, a, a Yang draft. So for configuration purpose, you have some profiles that are also defined in a, in a, in a draft and so on and so on. So one thing important to notice is that the IAM data is actually uh, going through its uh, second working group last call. So it's really mature and hopefully it's gonna be soon standardized. So now that you have a big picture of IOM, let's focus on IPv6 as the encapsulation protocol. And as I said, there is a specific draft for that, which is the IOM IPv6 options. And basically this draft defines two new uh, TLVs, one for uh, a hop by hop extension header and one for destination extension header. Those two new values have already been allocated uh, by INA, so you can find them on their website or inside the patch I have submitted, so you can see that in a few slides. IOM options requirements uh, are an alignment of 4N, so that uh, each IOM data is aligned on its natural boundary. There exist four uh, different IOM option types. Uh, the two first ones are pre-allocated trace and the incremental trace. They are similar. The only difference is that obviously in pre-allocated trace, the first node will just pre-allocate all the space for each node on the path. And as for the incremental trace, each node is responsible for its own allocation and it's, uh, to insert its data. Uh, the third one is the proof of transit option. So basically you will use it if you wanna make sure that you have followed a specific path and each node was intended to, to be there. And the last one, which is more for a destination extension header is the edge to edge. So this is in a scenario where you want to have an exchange of IOM data between the source and the destination only. So why is it pre-allocated trace in bold? Because we will focus only on this uh, option here because 
obviously this is the only one that was implemented in the patch for many reasons. I won't expand on that. So on the right, you have uh, the structure of the packet. So the first line, we can skip it because it's basically the extension header header following with uh, two octets of padding to align uh, the IOM option. Then you have the TL uh, of the IOM option. IOM type refers to the, to the IOM options I cited just before. So in this case, pre-allocated trace is zero. So IOM type field should be zero here. The two next lines are actually the pre-allocated trace header. And here the namespace ID is the IOM na namespace. So it has nothing to do with uh, what you know in Linux, uh, like network uh, namespace. So here IOM namespaces uh, are useful to bring some context to uh, IOM data. And also it allows us to have multiple same options, same IOM options inside the same packet. So you can see that as a unique ID between the IOM type and the namespace ID. Following the namespace, you have the node land and remaining land. So this is just two, uh, two values that allows a node to know the length of the data it has to insert and what, uh, what space is left. The flags, so I mentioned the flags that you have. Uh, you have, for instance, the overflow flag which is uh, used to uh, notify uh, next nodes uh, if the flag is set uh, to tell the nodes that you have no space to insert, so you can skip it, so it's faster. The IOM trace type is actually defined in the IOM data draft. So it, this is a bit field, so each bit corresponds to an IOM data option uh, defined in that draft, so that the node knows uh, what option it has to insert or not. And then you have each block of data for each node. So for instance, this is inserted from bottom to left, uh, to, to top, sorry. So this is just like a stack. And for instance, here, after the IOM trace type, the first data node is the last one on the path and so on until the first node on the path, all right? So let's review some interesting use cases for IPv6 and IOM. The first one is actually a fast failure detection and isolation. So you're gonna tell me, hey, we have already trace route for that, for instance, but yeah, trace route is slow. And the, the big difference here is that we actually are making the same thing as trace route, but here we only need one packet. So we send one packet and each node on the path will reply with one packet containing IOM data. So you are uh, using N packets where TraceRoot would use two N packets. So there is a big difference and you have only one packet and one run trip time to grab back the data. The second one is a smart service selection and load balancing. So you can see, I'm sorry for the quality of this image, yeah. but you can see somewhere in the middle, there is something called yeah. an Anycast server. And actually the client will just ask the server to contact a, a service. And the server, so the M Anycast server is responsible for choosing the best one at that moment. So you can have a lot of criteria. And to decide this, it will use IOM and it will contact every uh, service uh, that is available. Uh, I forgot to mention that each service is a duplication of the other, so that's why the load balancing, right? Uh, once the, the, the server has chosen uh, the best service at that moment, it will combine IOM with segment routing so that the client will steer the traffic to the service directly. So the client will directly communicate with the service in that case. And it corresponds to the best, the best service for the client. And another killer use case, uh, there are more, but I will focus on those three. This one we have called it cross-layer telemetry. So for those who know about uh, tracer and tracing tools like Jagger and open telemetry, etc. Well, you know that uh, we have a visibility on layer five six and seven. So the goal here is to use IOM to correlate trace IDs 
with network packets so that we can regroup everything and have a total visib visibility on the network stack. So here, thanks to IOM, we inject the trace and span IDs of the tracing tool. And at the end, we have a total visibility on the stack from layer two to layer seven. So this is a huge improvement because if you have already used such tools, for instance, if you want to debug an SQL um, request, well, usually you have layer five to seven info. And now if you have something that is going wrong on the link or below layer five, well, you could wait to, 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 to determine the, the, the problem. So now you can directly check what's going on and, and apply an action for that. So feel free to visit uh, my repo. Uh, the link is on the slide. There is a video demonstration for that, and I yeah. think you'll like it. Right, so let's go to the implementation. On the top of the slide, uh, I've put uh, a link. Uh, actually, this is the, the thread of uh, the patch I have submitted. So this is the first version of the patch. And there are a lot of discussion with Tom Herbert, and I think they are interesting to read. So quickly, uh, the patch uh, yeah. includes uh, a new hash table for IOM namespaces. In extension headers, uh, I have implemented the processing of IOM uh, up by hop, uh, sorry, IOM uh, pre-allocated trace options inside the up by hop. The insertion of IOM data if the IOM namespace is known. So this is a configuration that is made through Netlink, generic Netlink, Netlink sorry. And uh, the user tool is IP root 2. And also uh, another new feature, which is to remove uh, an IOM option. So basically it is just removing a TLV from uh, an extension header. And so talking about that, we had a big discussion with Tom again on this because this is not comp compliant with the RFC 8200. And I agree with him. Um, so my response to that was to, to say, hey, maybe we could just have it uh, for freedom uh, towards uh, users because uh, it may not happen uh, anytime. So it depends totally on the operator configuration. So it could be possible that the operator configures it so that you don't have to remove uh, on the pass uh, a TLV. So we still need to discuss it on the ITF and maybe there is something to improve here. And also the last point is actually just an anonymous de decapsulation of an IPv6 and IPv6 tunnel. Right, so um, a small explanation on why I have assumed by default a, a 8N boundary uh, when I remove options. So on the left, you have an example that works and on the right, an example that wouldn't work. So let's assume an option X, which is 2N aligned, a Y option that is 4N aligned, and a Z option that is 8N aligned. So again, on the left, if you remove the option, so this is obviously option to be removed. If you remove it, Y option is still 4N aligned, and Z option is still 8N aligned. However, on the right, if you remove again the option, Y is still 4N aligned, but this time Z is 4N aligned. So that's a big problem because actually you don't want to reorder and restructure every possible option after the removed one, because from a performance point of view, it's not acceptable. So the compromise here is to just assume by default an 8N uh, alignment. And the price to pay, if I can call that that way, this is small price, but the price to pay is that you may have at most four uh, octets of padding that would be useless. And I think this is quite acceptable because it's the fastest processing. But again, maybe we won't need this. It depends on if uh, we keep uh, the removing of uh, an option or not. So now the control plane implementation, this is not part of the draft. 
Um, so this part is compliant with the RFC 8200 because we, we are covering uh, the two scenarios. The first one is ingress to ingress, ingress to egress, sorry. So we use the encapsulation. And for the host to host uh, scenario, we are directly inser inserting IOM data. So this is the inline insertion. There is a representation uh, on the graphic below uh, of an IOM buffer, which is, this, there is no magic. This is just uh, the representation of an extension header, in this case, uh, hop by hop, with uh, IOM options next to each other. So my question is, uh, this is the open question right now, what should we do with that? So currently in my personal uh, implementation, I have it stored in uh, network devices directly. So there is a new field in uh, net device structure. But again, I'm not sure this is the best choice. So here are some choices I could think about. The first one would be to use lightweight tunnels and root netlink so that um, IOM the IOM buffer uh, would be attached to a root. That could be discussed because I'm not totally convinced that having a, a buffer, the IOM buffer attached per, per root would be meaningful. I don't know. Uh, we have also uh, the possibility to use generic netlink. So as for the first part, and there we could store as it is right now, directly inside the uh, structure of uh, that device, or we could store it somewhere else. So I'm all here if you have ID. And there is also a third possibility, which I didn't mention on the slide, which is another solution if you have another one. So again, if you have an intuition or something, feel free to speak and I'll be glad to hear you. Let's uh, review some early results uh, from a performance point of view. And I guess that Tolkien fans will appreciate the testbed. So Gimli uh, on the extreme left is the traffic generator and Legolas is the traffic receiver. Mary and Pippin are respectively the ingress and the egress of the IAM domain. And Sam is just an IOM node on the path. So what happens here is that Mary will receive traffic from Gimli. It will encapsulate it. So we have now an outer IPv6 header and an inner IPv6 header. So we don't touch the user traffic and the IOM data will be inserted inside the outer header. And then Mary, Sam and Pippin will insert their data uh, after each one. And Pippin finally will decapsulate the packet. And so Legolas will receive the packet untouched. So this is the scenario we measured here. And obviously on the left graph, you can see that with big packets, so in this case, it was MTU sized packets, um, 1500 byte packets. Actually it is um, 1236 byte packets, but when we insert IOM data, it's the MTU size. So with big packets, there is no such high drop, but with small packets, 78 byte packets, you can see the variations. Uh, so it's logical because the, the kernel is more stressed. So we will use it as a base. Uh, so small packets as a base because you can see uh, what's going on better. And we are going to vary some parameters. And on the right graph, we first vary the frequency of IOM insertion. So obviously uh, having 100% of insertion is not good. So that means that you insert IOM at every packet you see. And we have the same test for 50, so one over two, 25, 10, five, et cetera, et cetera. So from the graph, you could tell that 10% or 25% would be acceptable. So that could be an advice to an operator, but again, that depends on a lot of parameters. On the next two graphs, we vary the number of IOM options, and then on the right, we vary the number of IOM namespaces. So, a namespace brings more overhead than an option. 
So on the left, you can see that until the eighth option, it's okay. We don't lose anything. And up to the nine, we start dropping. So there is a logical explanation to that. And we are around an overhead of uh, 200 bytes. And my intuition is that it's actually because of an implicit re reallocation of the socket buffer, because there is no space anymore uh, to insert the data. And that would explain uh, such high drop uh, starting from the ninth option. And we could have the same reasoning for uh, the graph on the right. So when we vary the number of IOM namespaces, and let me count one, two, three, four, five, six. It starts dropping um, starting from the sixth one and especially after the sixth one. So it corresponds actually to the same overhead uh, we have observed previously on the, on the left graph, which is around uh, 200 uh, bytes. So I guess this is, this is the explanation and I will try to dig deeper to see if there is something more. Actually, there is another uh, explanation, but I don't think this is a problem. For each namespace, there is a lookup in the hash table. So the more namespaces you have, the more lookups you have. But again, it should be oh, one operation because the hash table is uh, optimized for that and it shouldn't be any collision. So that's the explanation for now. From those results, uh, we could advise operators to have a mix, uh, which is uh, more real for uh, an, a more real example for real life. So we could have, for instance, a frequency of one or two percent with five or six options with four or five namespaces. It would work. And this is uh, a, re a representation uh, during uh, line rate. So the server was under heavy load. So you could also adapt uh, the, the frequency of insertion depending on the traffic you, you are seeing at that moment. So you can have a dynamic threshold, for instance. That's an idea. So as a conclusion, I think that having IOM inside the kernel would be a nice feature to have. So from an industry point of view, I think that it would be nice to have it so that operators could choose the Linux kernel and not have to choose something else to have IOM. Uh, just think about bypassing frameworks and everything like that. So it's kind of boring. So let's try to make Linux kernel famous like it is already. Um, again, I'm putting the, the link to the data plan patch I submitted around uh, a month or so. So you can follow the, the thread and read interesting um, discussion with Tom. So again, uh, what do we choose for uh, the control plane? Where should we store the IOM buffer? What's the best choice? Again, I'm all here. And a final word on the IETF. We have already run a project on IOM and IPv6 during uh, the hackathon last year with Tom, and it was actually fun and a success. So we could eventually make another one. So if we do, let's let's have fun together. So feel free to join, and we may have no crime for some help on some details. So for instance, uh, in IOM data, we have uh, to retrieve um, the queue length of the egress interface. So until now, I didn't succeed it. So maybe we can help, you can help me and we could work on everything and improve everything. So feel free to join. So I guess I was a bit fast. No, it's okay. So thank you again. Um, feel free to contact me. There is my address. Um, and feel free to ask me direct live just now. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, thanks, Justin. Um, so one, one comment I'd like to make on the uh, appeal to uh, get people to work on this and the ITF hackathons. I would point out that um, for those of you who might be kind of newbies uh, to Linux development um, and want to get into it, 
this this is a, a sort of project that's really good for that. It's somewhat standalone, but it also leverages uh, several of the APIs, and it raises some interesting questions like the IOM buffer. Um, we have several techniques, and and this is a case where finding that right technique actually requires interaction with the community. So it's uh, it's a really good project for that point of view. So I do encourage people. Um, looking to get into development, uh, this is a really good project uh, for that. Uh, that being said, we do have some questions. Uh, so first of all, and I think there was some discussion on this, but, but how is the loopback flag actually used? Well, mainly for um, the faster trace route. So you could imagine having some, some other use case, I don't know. But here, it's mainly for the faster trace route. So when, when we're using this, does this run the risk of um, any sort of packet amplification attacks? Yeah, as I said, this is still under discussion uh, in the working group so uh, that every aspect of security is covered because um, there, were, there were some problems with that. So currently so this is not used uh, in implementation right now. So I would clarify, so the in-situ um, part of IOM means that this is really in-band data. So we're annotating the actual packets carrying the data. And there are alternatives being proposed. Um, obviously, if we're putting data into packets for measurement, that's affecting the size of the packets. Yeah. And people do notice that. And one thing we're seeing is IOEM segment routing, these potentially are really big headers. And that starts to become a problem, especially for hardware devices that uh, aren't, aren't, aren't able to process those headers. And we also have other problems along these lines. So even getting extension headers through uh, devices has been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, fortunately, IOEM is usually constrained to a, a closed domain where we can control things like that. Okay, so I did want to comment on okay, I, the... I thought it was a question, actually. <laughs> well, the, um, let me comment on the uh, extension header insertion. So this is a much larger topic than just IOAM. Uh, what happened was the segment routing um, proponents, uh, specifically Cisco, wanted to insert um, extension headers into packets on the fly without changing the IP header or without doing encapsulation. And this created a, well, for lack of a better word, a very animated discussion with I, in IETF because RFC 8200, which defines the IPv6 specification, clearly says that intermediate devices are not supposed to insert or change um, things like extension headers. And there are some practical considerations in this that we point out. So for instance, if I increase the size of a packet in the middle of the network, that runs the risk that that packet might be dropped by a later node uh, because MTUs exceed it. And it's possible in certain conditions that path MTU or getting a packet too big actually wouldn't solve the problem. So um, the other one uh, was anytime we modify the packet in a non-standard way, if it's covered by the IP um, extent or authentication header, now we run the risk of the packet being dropped. Um, and again, the, the device in the middle of the network would have no idea that the packet's dropped because it's being dropped by a later downstream node. So there's been a, a ton of discussion on this. And one of the outcomes was uh, I tried to propose uh, kind of a fix for this where we would allow nodes to insert the sort of data extension headers without encapsulation. However, they have to identify the data that's been inserted and they have to identify basically who inserted it so we have attribution. So um, that's what that's about. And the stat state of that is I do want to take this to become a working group item. And I, I think it's a good compromise between on, on one hand we have the the zealots of IETF who 
Uh, we'll jump up and down whenever we're violating uh, a full internet standard, which RFC 8200 is, versus a pretty large contingent of uh, vendors and operators who, who want to do this. And there are some valid reasons. Actually, I think IOM is a much more valid reason than even segment routing for some reasons. So I'm hoping to uh, push that and subsequently get some patches upstream. So I think, I, Justin, I think it is possible, um, but we have to do this in the right way. Uh, and the, the thing here is this isn't really just about Linux. What we have to be careful of is setting the precedent and we don't want um, the router vendors pointing to us and say, if they're doing it, we can do it. So we really want to do things right in Linux. And um, that's why I think we need to be careful about uh, slipping in um, patches that circumvent RFC 8200. In all fairness, segment routing already does this, but we'd, we'd also have to fix that. Well, as a side note, um, maybe we could just remove um, the feature to, to remove uh, an AUM option. Um, so we could avoid this problem. Uh, anyway, I think your solution, your draft could be useful. Uh, maybe for the incremental trace, because each node would have to increase the space of uh, the extension header. So we could have something like a new uh, option in your draft. So I think this is something useful, interesting. Okay, so I, I think in the short term, that would be good, but I, I do wanna get this in the long term um, because I think there's value in it. So uh, about the question you proposed to the community, um, thank you for proposing questions. I think that's really good. Uh, I guess my question in response to that is, um, what's the best way to, to proceed? So uh, we can either have, you can either uh, have individuals reach out to you. Um, if, if it warrants it and we have enough interest, we could do a, maybe a, a breakout session on this. Um, yeah. Or uh, the other alternative that, that's worked before is um, do RRCs for various solutions and uh, post them upstream. Uh, sometimes it is hard to get, get interest on RRCs. But if you find that one one person who happens to be interested in, then it works out really well. Okay, so I'm checking for any more questions. Um, all right, so I uh, I think that uh, was good. Um,